Now, this gentleman here, uh, Merle Temple, I'm glad to have you with us today, Merle. You just come and take the rest of the time, and we'll be praying for you. God bless you. Down there, you need to talk into that one. Doesn't know where you are. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Brother Jerry. Thanks for having me. I hope this uh, front mic here is good enough for my soft voice. And I, too, am kind of recovering from a, uh, a nasty uh, virus that now my wife Judy has. So it's, it's going around, I think. And it's great to be back in uh, Oklahoma County. I uh, was just interviewed. I spoke uh, out on the Belden campus of ICC. Uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and they interviewed me about being an alumna, alumnus of ICC, a graduate, and uh, uh, asked me about my memories of, of that. And I said, well, one thing, it was called IJC. You know, so, so long ago, the kids now, they don't know, uh, you know, that it was called, probably called IJC once upon a time. But I told them the, some of the special memories we had. And, you know, I just come home from uh, Washington, D.C. I, I graduated high school down at Nettleton in 1966 and uh some strange reason i caught a, a, a train in corinth the next week and i uh, went to rode all night went to washington dc and it was quite an adventure you know for a young uh, country boy uh who lived down in uh, temple grove uh, down just north of nettleton on highway six and you know never really been uh, too many places you know by myself and that was quite an adventure I went up there and worked for the FBI as a fingerprint technician, and I still remember that night arriving you know, on the train at uh, you know to Central Station, and uh, you know seeing the lighted dome of the Capitol and and uh, the Washington Monument, and <clears throat> so many uh, iconic images like that. And and Lord, certainly things have really uh, have changed in our country since then, and we have uh, you know tremendous uh, challenges before us. And you know, I talk about some of those when I'm out traveling the country and um, talking about my books. We have um, uh, two books out, two novels, uh, the first two in a trilogy, and I'm writing a third now. And the uh, first book is called A Ghostly Shade of Pale, and the second book's A Rented World, and the third one I'm writing now is uh, The Redeemed. And uh, these are Christian books. Uh, this is a ministry to us, and they're written as novels, as fiction, but they're drawn from my life. And I promised God that I would um, tell my story, his story, uh, and uh, his story of redemption uh, in uh, three, three books. And uh, it's uh, kind of uh, tough sometimes, as I call it, digging up bones and, uh, and, and remembering a lot of things and embracing a lot of pain uh, from the past. And, you know, most people would rather uh, just forget. But uh, and sometimes when I'm, I'm writing and typing on my keyboard at home, uh, my wife Judy worries about me because uh, she'll hear me and then see me crying sometimes. And uh, so I jokingly told some friends that uh, the old song, Tears on My Pillow, you know, I changed that to Tears on My Keyboard. And uh, But uh, I told her it was okay. I'm just cleaning out closets up in my mind. Some of them I thought I'd clean now, but I haven't. But I said, it'll be good for me in the long run. And it's a promise I made to God. Otherwise, I might have... Uh, you know, quit uh, writing these books, but you know, you make a promise to God, and that's not a promise you break. And uh, uh, so we press on with that, and I uh, was so happy he to come over here to Etiwamba um, County, and uh, uh, a lot of memories here for us, and, and just thrilled as we can be that uh, ICC uh, last uh, first of uh, uh, first of this year, uh, last semester, uh, they. They picked A Ghostly Shade of Pale as their contemporary novel for two years and made it required reading for all English students. And uh, so we came over to the Fulton campus and talked to an auditorium uh, full of students and, uh, and also did that at the Tupelo campus of ICC as well. So um, it, uh, I just love to get out and, and talk with young people. Uh, you know, remember how I was in those days. And, uh, you know, they often say, whatever's on their mind and you know they're, they're not guarded and uh, many of them haven't learned to be politically correct yet and I just love to engage them and uh, talk about the books talk about my journey in life and uh, you know how I came to uh, find out um, you know who and who and what never mattered in life and uh, who and what always will 
And uh, there were times I was a nominal Christian in my life, and uh, sometimes I was raised in church, but you know, I never really understood that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And there were times, you know, that I let go of his hand, you know, and I, and I, when I get in a jam, sometimes I'd wonder, you know, where is he? Where is he? I, you know, I can't find him. Well, you know, it always turned out he was right where I left him. Man. When I pushed him all off it at a distance, he was right there. He wasn't lost. You know, I was lost. And so, uh, uh, we talk about that and so much more in this adventure, this adventure and this, uh, odyssey that we've been on, uh, as we travel the country and try to serve the Lord. And, uh, uh, when, uh, a ghostly shade of pale, uh, was about to come out, uh, the first book in a trilogy, I knew, uh, uh, someone's cousin who worked at Criminal Minds, a, a TV show in Hollywood. And, and, uh, we, uh, sent, uh, the manuscript out to Jim Kameni, the writer producer out there and asked him to read it and tell me if it was any good or if uh, I should do humanity a favor and burn all copies. And uh, so uh, Jim uh, said he would, would read it and he got back to me after a while, been about a couple of months, they were real busy filming. And I finally got the email from him and, and I was afraid to open it, but I opened it and he said, I'm sorry it took so long. He said, I just had to stop. You're not quite done. I had to stop and tell you. He said, you're not only a great writer, you're a great writer of American literature. And that's what this is, a big crime story literature. He said, come to Hollywood. I want to represent you. So we loaded up the uh, Nissan Murano with so many books. We didn't have any bounce left in our spring going out on, springs going out on I-40. It was kind of cl clock, cl clock, you know, when we'd hit a bump out there. And it worked our way out there. And uh, it was just uh, like a fairy tale. It really was. And and all my friends were worried about me. You know, they said, you're going to, uh, like, Babylon. <laughs> and uh, and I said, yeah. I said, Judy and I just uh, planned to uh, uh, to march around the city and blow our horns you know, and, and until the walls fall down, and, uh, and uh, kind of like Jericho. And so, uh, but when we got out there, you know, we found uh, a lot of nice people. Uh, found a lot of, met a lot of believers out in California who humbled us and certainly humbled me. Uh, it's not easy out there uh, to follow Jesus. Uh, it's pretty tough at times in that environment, but uh, but they were strong, uh, strong in the Lord, and uh, and they just humbled us. And uh, and then the the non-believers that we met were courteous to us and uh, very nice and welcoming, and um, and maybe at times one or two just kind of tolerated us, but they still were very kind because they liked the writing in the book, and that's what I had prayed for. And I asked the Lord to help me write a book that was so um, intriguing and had enough, uh, you know, adventure and mystery and and uh, history in it, you know, that would be so intriguing to the secular world, you know, that they couldn't ignore us and just uh, kick us to the curb like they uh, often do with any Christian writers. And uh, so we, we, uh, the, we stuck with that plan and uh, the Lord blessed us. And when the book was coming out, right at the front, we, uh, uh, people in the industry, you know, told us that we would, uh, this is pretty good stuff, you know, but you need some neon in the book. And I asked them, I said, well, what, uh, you know, what do you mean by neon? And uh, they sent me some of my writing back that just was uh, peppered with the worst profanity they put in there uh, that you can imagine. I said, no, I can't do that. And, and of course, they like the graphic intimacy and those type of things. And, and they're formula driven, too. Whatever was hot yesterday, they want to copy. And so they said, well, uh, could you add some vampires uh, to it? And I said, well, uh, no, you know, I don't think so. We met some bad people in the days of a ghost of Shader Pale, but I don't think uh, any were certified vampires. And, and then they say, well, you might not want to mention God because you may offend somebody. And I said, well, let me see if I understand, you know, uh, profanity good, uh, intimacy good, uh, vampires good, but God not good. And I said, no, I can't do any of that. And I said, I'm writing books to honor God. Yeah. And that if my mama and my English teacher were still living, I wouldn't be ashamed for them to see and read my books. And uh, that, that meant everything to me, to honor God and my mother and my English teacher. So we're stuck with our guns, and when the book began to come out, 
Uh, <clears throat> we uh, we signed uh, at Reeds, our kickoff at Reeds Gum Tree in Tupelo. And I thought we'd, uh, some of the observers of the book world in this area thought we, since we were new and so forth, we might, we might sign 25, 30, 35 books if we were lucky. And uh, we signed for seven hours. They brought food to my table, and I think we wound up signing uh, 235 books. And Mr. Jack Reed Sr. said, if everybody got out and worked as hard as you do, Merle, said we'd all be in great shape. Of course, I had, uh, you know, I had the big, uh, uh, the big man who was taking care of everything for me. We give him all the glory in, uh, in what we do. And uh, he is just an amazing, the doors he's opened, and all the so-called experts said couldn't be opened. So we went out to Hollywood and uh, we signed copies of A Ghost of Shade of Pale for the uh, cast of Criminal Minds and to watch them film. And I have to say, you know, we, we met Shamar Moore and Matthew Gray Gubler and Joe Mantegna and Thomas Gibson, and a lot of those folks. And they, they just couldn't have been any nicer to us. Very gracious. And, uh, and then we um, uh, did uh, interviews and uh, book signings. And, uh, and uh, when poor I'd left Tupelo, I received a uh, call from a friend. He said, well, you're a Christian. You're going to Hollywood. You should try to get on KKLA in Los Angeles. That's the uh, largest Christian radio station in America, in L.A. of all places. And uh, I didn't think he really thought I had a chance of doing that. But I, I looked on their website, and I couldn't find a producer. They usually book guests. And uh, I just clicked at uh, the down uh, the the screen, uh, the list of all the uh, on-air hosts fell down to for me to look at. I don't know why I did that, because uh, uh, because I didn't know any of them. But when I did, uh, the Holy Spirit pointed at one, Frank Sontag, and I didn't know Frank Sontag had the largest show on the largest Christian station. Couldn't find a contact for him, thought it might be on a Facebook page for his show. So I hopped over there, and uh, sure enough, they, uh, uh, they had a page, and I just took a chance and shot it into the blind. Uh, my story and uh, said I was coming to LA and uh, went back to, to typing at my desk and uh, <clears throat> on air talent never look at their Facebook pages and producers do every once in a while and uh, about 15 minutes so my private line rang on my desk and um, and it was uh, Frank Sontag he said this is Frank Sontag from LA and uh uh, I said, well, hello, Frank. And he said, no, you don't understand, Merle. He said, uh, I'm never here at this time of day in the studio. He said, but something would not leave me alone at home and uh, told me I had to go into the station. And he said, when I got here, he said, nothing would do but that I check the Facebook page. And he said, you must understand, I never, ever, 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 ever check the Facebook page. And he said, I saw there one message, and he said, I, I must contact this man immediately. And I said, well, Frank, uh, I think this was a guy thing. And he had me tell that story on the air. He gave me an hour of drive time from 5 to 6 to give my testimony to Southern California. And uh, strictly a God thing. And it was quite emotional, quite moving, and uh, uh, a lot of lumps and throats, uh, I think, that day, and a lot of wet eyes and I know my eyes were, were wet and uh, I think Judy's too and uh, but you know when I walked out of that uh, interview I told Judy I said I have never felt more in the perfect will of God in my life uh, I said uh, everything I've gone through all the ups and the downs the joy and, and especially the pain the tragedy uh, it's all been preparation for this platform that he was giving me to talk about him and uh, about the day that I just crawled to the foot of the cross. Crawled to the foot of the cross and said, Master, I have ruined this life. May I have another? And grace and mercy just poured out on me from his wounded side. And nothing has ever been the same again. And, and I wish that for everybody. And that's a big part of our message that we take. Now, Ghostly Shader Pale was set, um, or I should say, that after that radio broadcast, we, we, we signed uh, in the age of L.A. at a Lifeway store. We were brand new, uh, 2,000 miles from home. No one knew us. 
and uh, we had to beg our way in to sign there, do a consignment signing at uh, Lifeway because we weren't in any of the big chains and we are now. And But they had heard me on KKLA and people poured into the store. And we signed more books than anybody ever had at that store except Charles Stanley. And Brother Stanley's been on TV for 60 years. You know, so that's a pretty good company to be in. And uh, so we signed 100 books there and then went up to Malibu for a signing and uh, uh, had dinner with the producers of Saving Private Ryan to talk about the book. And, uh, and then I had an interview uh, in Beverly Hills that Criminal Minds had arranged on an insider TV show called Media Mayhem. And uh, we were driving uh, to that uh, interview through Beverly Hills and Judy and I were kind of you know, looking around at all the iconic images all around us. You know, and gawking like a, a couple of country bumpkins that we were, and and I looked at Judy and I said, Judy, I said we are the Beverly Hillbillies, and uh, all we need is Granny up on top of the Murano in the rocking chair, you know, and we'd be we'd be set. Yeah, but it was great, and we went to that show, and uh, nice young man who looked a whole lot like his daddy did when he was young, uh, uh, Mel Gibson's son Will. Uh, Mike me and powdered my shiny head and uh, and the lady who interviewed me, uh, Allison Hope Weiner, is a, a big entertainment lawyer out there and uh, also her brother created Mad Men and uh, there was just a lot of Hollywood connections in that studio and that studio had a lot of mystique and you know very dark and uh, you know kind of like some of these uh, I told everybody it's like some of these uh, film. Uh, noir things out of the 40s and 50s you know where all you needed you know was a fog coming in and Humphrey Bogart walking out with a trench coat you know in the Casablanca had that kind of feel to it but it went it went really well and we did about an hour interview there and um, you know that went up on uh, YouTube and a lot of our stuff's up on YouTube uh, most of our stuff is our talks and the interviews and we began to do interviews uh, all over the country and, and all over the world uh, about a ghostly shade of pale, which was taken, uh, drawn from the time when I left Ole Miss in the early 70s, and President Nixon had just declared the first war on drugs, and um, I decided, probably foolishly, that that was the place for me, and I went into that as an agent, and uh, and uh, it was just a different time. It's uh, history. It's a time that people think they know in Mississippi in this area of the South, but, but uh, probably really don't. You know, it was the end of the war, it was coming, it was winding down, and that was bleeding over uh, in, into the South, into Mississippi, and uh, a lot of corruption, a lot of drug money and organized crime, you know, corrupting public officials, and, uh, and the, the, uh, some of the intelligence agencies of the federal government, you know, were running guns uh, through Mississippi, and they were using small airfields uh, that we have so many of to hire mercenaries to pop out of those uh, fields and uh, fly under radar into Central America, running guns uh, to whoever we were supporting at the time. And uh, the problem was that when they came back, those mercenaries were loaded down; their planes were loaded with drugs, and the only question was whether it was sanctioned or not. And and we believed at times that it was. Uh, and it was just a, a different time, a dangerous time. Um, and uh, we went into all of that. And um, then I was working undercover in South Mississippi. There weren't very many of us then. So if you got in trouble, you were pretty much on your own. It was just you and the Lord. Uh, uh, because there weren't, there weren't very many of us and no one was coming to your rescue. And I was working solo undercover in South Mississippi in Tyler Town. And, in 1972, and some heroin dealers surprised me earlier than the deal was scheduled for, and uh, I was kind of forced to go out with them to talk about the deal, and out, out near midnight, traveling out to the middle of nowhere, I, if they'd let me out, I never could have found my way back, probably, and uh, down on the Mississippi-Louisiana border, and it was uh, dark, and you, you know, we went to where the highway ended, then where the blacktop ended, then where the dirt road ended, and then we were on paths bumping out through fields. And it was like, you know, moss, you know, drape, you know scraping and limbs scraping across the top of the car. And, 
you know, and, and then you'd merge in the middle of nowhere, and there was this little shack up on stilts out there, and and uh, it looked like a scene out of every bad B horror movie, you know, you'd ever seen. And um, uh, you expected Freddy to jump out with a chainsaw or something, and I went inside, and this one I did, they pulled guns on me, put a pistol to my forehead and a shotgun in my stomach, and uh, they decided uh, they were going to keep their drugs, their heroin, and just take my money and kill me. And uh, so they began to debate about where to dump my body and and that sort of thing. And um, during the middle of all that, the one sitting across from me, uh, who was staring at me, he produced a one of those old Gillette double double edged Gillette razor blades sharp things cut your end of your finger right off if y'all remember them and uh he looked at me never eyes never leaving mine and he'd just gotten out of angola prison which was a bad place then i've kind of turned it around now but it was really a bad place then and uh he looked at me and he he put the razor blade in his mouth and he bit down on it and twisted on it and he bit it in two and he swallowed the razor blade and of course, it just cut his mouth up terribly. And then the blood just began, he smiled at me, and the blood just rushed out, bubbled up at the corners of his mouth, and ran down on his throat. And he put his hand in and got a mouthful of blood and asked me if I wanted some. <laughs> and I told him, no, I didn't think so. And, uh, and then after that, he got a whole box of long stem kitchen matches and uh, had them all lit at once. And there, you know, at midnight out there, these guns on me and all of this happening, you know, he bent over while the other one had the pistol on me. He bent over and put his mouth down over the flame and swallowed the flame as the blood was pouring out of his mouth. And that's when my whole life flashed before my eyes. And I think it's, it's true what they say, that when you believe you're about to die, you know, you see things that you can't consciously recall, and I certainly did. I saw myself as a toddler uh, holding my parents' hands when I was a little bitty thing, walking with them. You know, a lot of beautiful images, really. And I tell people I wouldn't recommend the stimulus that, that it took to uh, to reduce that. Uh, but a lot of prayers went up that night, and, you know, I was not, not one to pray uh, very seldom. And... Uh, but I did some prayers that night. I didn't ask for deliverance, but I asked to see one more sunrise. I didn't think I deserved deliverance or to get in my cell in such a jam. And uh, But uh, it's a long story. It's in the book. But um, but God did deliver me. I did see another sunrise. And uh, it was quite a big thing when it hit the press all over the uh, state and maybe the tri-state area. You know, a state agent had been held hostage and kidnapped by drug dealers. It was headlines were, were everywhere and big headlines in the Jackson Clare and Ledger. Um, and so um, after that, I was named to be a topside investigator up in Vaithful. There's only been one other outside the uh, uh, Capitol at that time as we were growing and learning. And so they put me up there and uh, working all over that area and all the way up to Memphis. And, uh, and we... Um, I uh, learned of a um, organized crime stronghold in DeSoto County, and uh, I had gotten a call from a, a man who, who wanted to um, give me information about it because actually he was a member of organized crime, and the other organized crime people had pushed him out, so he wanted revenge. And, of course, you know, uh, that's where you get your, as a police officer, that's where you get your good information. It's not from... Uh, uh, folks down on Main Street, but uh, although their support is very important, but you get it from people who travel in the dark underbelly of the world. And uh, so we hit those, uh, made a case, watched them, interview, uh, uh, surveilled them for a long time, and built a strong case. They had a lot of political protection, uh, so we didn't tell anybody we were there or that we were coming the night we came because they would have picked up the phone and said, you know, the state narcs are on the way. And, uh, but they had a string of nightclubs there, a syndicate, a network. And uh, they were all at this one big club that night, and they were, uh, there were police officers in there helping them set up dice tables. 
you know, it was uh, sad to see. We documented all of that. And uh, they were selling drugs table to table. It was very much like the old setup in the original Walking Tall movie. Very much like that. And some of the real people actually out of McNary County, Tennessee, in the Walking Tall days had come down to be a part of this syndicate along with the Dixie Mafia and uh, some of the regular Mafia elements. And uh, so uh, it was quite a, a gathering of uh, professional criminals there. So we, we hit them that night, arrested a lot of people, and a lot of people were really upset. And when they found out we were in there and they didn't know it because they'd been paying protection money, and, and, uh, but they weren't protected by the people they were paying, and some of the people they had paid were quite upset too. And um, uh, a lot of that came out later. Uh, and uh, so right after that, uh, I had, when I had developed an informant inside, and so the uh, um, informant called me, who worked in that syndicate and uh, told me, well, they're having a meeting of all the heads of the syndicate today. And I said, well, what are they talking about? And she said, well, uh, <laughs> pooling their money and who they're going to hire to kill you. And I said, well, yeah, they're not going to do that. I said, that would be a terrible business decision, you know, to kill a state police officer. You know, they're just mad right now. It'll blow over because that'd bring the world. The world would come out on them if they killed a state police officer. She said, no, they're serious. And so just a bit after that, I got a call from a guy, and he said, well, he said, I, w I want to give you some information. And and I uh, said, y'all did real well up there, but I think you know you missed a few people. And he said, I can give them to you. And uh, so I felt kind of funny about it. And uh, and he was from Memphis, and I said, I'll meet you in Memphis. And he, no, he didn't want to meet in Memphis, and I suggested Sonotopia and Tate County, and he didn't want to meet there. He only wanted to meet in DeSoto County where they had political protection, the syndicate did. And they, they wanted to meet out in the woods. And I said, no, we're not meeting out in the woods. We're, I agreed to meet him at the Horn Lake exit there off of I-55. And there was everything's there now, but there was nothing there then except an old abandoned Gulf service station. And so we went, uh, I went up there and I, as I was going up there, I felt bad about it. And I pulled my gun out of my shoulder holster and put it underneath my belt and closed my coat over it. and. And uh, right after I left, my first wife, who's now deceased, Susan, got a call from my informant and said, is Merle there? And she said, no, he's gone somewhere. And uh, she said, get a hold of him and tell him it's a setup. They're going to kill him. And she hung up. And uh, Susan tried to raise me, and my police radio had gone out. And uh, so she couldn't raise me, so she was going crazy. And I got there, and there was not one guy but two guys there. And long story, but it deteriorated rather quickly and uh, we uh, uh, all wound up everybody kind of holding their guns in a standoff and later uh, we found out um, the numbers they were calling from and everything we had a second deal set up because they had threatened the district attorney too to kill him after they killed me and uh, uh, everybody was kind of nervous and we had another deal set up with them and they they got a little uh, anxious about it. They, I think they smelled that we were setting them up. And uh, and uh, so the, that meeting fell through. But the number they were calling from, we traced it back, and it was the, from the uh, headquarters of the syndicate that we had hit. And uh, a lot of things happened in the aftermath of that. Uh, uh, just a lot of stuff going on. And uh, it's all in my book, Augusta Shader Pale. And as time went by, I was promoted, became the first captain over uh, the whole North Atha state. And, and uh, in 1976, my man had done a heroin deal down with some dealers down near Columbus. And they were, they were flooding the Golden Triangle area with high-grade heroin to, to create a heroin market, primarily on the state campus and on MSCW then, MUW now and uh, to create an addict population. And they would put high-grade heroin in, and then once they had addicted people, they would, they would cut the purity down and, and raise their profits because people would have to buy more and more and more to get that original high that they were on and to feed their habit. And it was a insidious, uh, insidious type thing that they did. And, and so we had bought heroin from them, and we were going back to have a big buy bust, we called it, where we bought a large amount of heroin uh, with a lot, large amount of money that we couldn't let walk away. 
and we're trying to draw out any backers of theirs uh, who wouldn't let that amount of product uh, go out with any front people. And so I was in my office in Tupelo, and we uh, I was on my way to, to meet my men. I ran down and out of the office there in the old TNS building, for those who remember it, right by the federal building, right across from the Baptist Church. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, ran down to my car and jumped in my car and uh, cranked it, put my hand on the gear shift. And when I did, <coughs> the spirit filled up my car, wrapped all around me, all through me. I never experienced anything like that in my life. You know, I'd always kind of ran from God, and it uh, terrified me. <laughs> I was, what is this? And uh, it spoke to me very clearly, all around me, all through me, inside of me. I said, go back and get the bulletproof vest. And it, sh- sh- it subsided and was gone. And I'm like, what was that? I'm losing my mind. We don't have any reason to believe that... Uh, it's going to be more dangerous than usual. I said, I'm, you know, I've been working too hard, and I just lost my mind. And I just didn't like to wear those vests uh, because they were bulky and hard to conceal, even though it was in November and they had coats on. And uh, in those days, they didn't have any armor in the vest. So all it would stop was like up to a um, 38 caliber handgun, and that was all we had. And I said, I don't know where that was coming from. And uh, so I put my hand back on the gear shift, to leave and the spirit came right back in the car filled up the car in me around me there was nothing but me and the spirit and and it wasn't optional this time go back and get that vest and i said okay 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 like this and it subsided again i went back and got the vest and um, met the agents to set up the parameters of the deal and told them we'll be surveilling you closely and want y'all to keep it in town in Columbus so we can have buildings and things to hide behind we can stay close to you and listen to the body mics what's going on in case you need us to come in and I said oh it's fine you know and I said no 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 do that and I want you to wear these vests no we don't wear those vests you know no we don't fool with that and I said yeah I said don't ask me why I said just humor me and wear those vests and and uh, so uh we were doing the deal. The deal did get away from them. They let the, the dealers lure them out from downtown, out into the country, kind of uh, south of town. And and it was down on this road, and uh, that wound around, and there was a big high levee, and the road ran across, and depressions on either side that led off into the swamp. And over here was a railroad that came through, and it was a high railroad trestle there. And right up in here, by the railroad trestle was a clump of pine trees. What we didn't know was they had a sniper planted right in there behind the pine trees with a high-powered rifle to cover the deal. And so we had to lay back because we had nothing to hide from and the body mics were cutting in and out and in and out and and it was very frustrating because after what had happened to me in the car, I was very nervous for the men and and then you know, I heard them negotiating the deal, and then it cut in and out, and then I heard, uh, you know, you're under arrest, and it cut out, and then I heard, ta 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 ta. And I looked at the chief of intelligence with me in my car, and I said, Claude, was that, was that gunfire? And then the other agent started to erupt on the radio around on the other side of the deal, other perimeters, and, and uh, said, Merle, under fire. And uh, we came across a levee, caught in a crossfire. It was a scene uh, from your worst nightmare. Uh, everybody firing their guns. Uh, uh, one violator been shot. One agent been critically wounded. Uh, bullets flying everywhere. Gun smoke just hanging heavy in that cold, that ice cold day. Uh, clouds had rolled in and uh, all day. And just it was like un- it like nothing really I'd ever seen before. It just the clouds were so tight, they just carpeted the earth and just like squeezed every bit of the light from the surface almost. And under that umbrella, which later was the biggest ice storm I think we'd ever seen in the state, and just made everything from Jackson to Corinth one big sheet of ice later that night. But uh, underneath that was just this gun smoke, you know, just drifting and hanging in that air and just drifting across the scene. and. Everything was in slow motion, and you hear people barking on the radio, and 
and uh, the agents were nervous, they were scared, they were firing even at shadows, you know, and it was just mayhem. And then we rolled out of the car and took cover, and the female agent who was with the male agent who made the buy, she told me that Jerry's hit bad, he's, he's hit bad. And I said, her, go to the hospital, go, go. And uh, so she went to the hospital, took off for the hospital with him, and and she had shot a violator on the scene, the one who doing the, the deal, went in to draw out his weapon, and she shot him just as he was drawing out right through his wrist. And uh, it was a horrifying day for, really, we were young then. We were in our 20s, and, you know, I was a captain, but I wasn't really, I was just a few years older, you know, than some of these agents who were... Um, you know, were pretty young themselves. And um, uh, so we finally secured the scene. The sniper had fled the scene. And and uh, we, uh, I went to the hospital and arrested a violator who had also come there for treatment of his gun, gunshot wound and uh, comforted, tried to comfort the young female agent and told her she had done a good job and just seen her partner shot many times and she just shot her first person. <laughs> You know, it was a traumatic day for anybody, especially somebody that young. And I went into the ER, and when I walked into the ER, they had my friend Jerry on the table, and they were cutting his clothes off. And then when they got down to cut the vest off, it's a white vest, and it was crimson soaked in blood. And uh, it was a bad time. And a doctor said, Merle, look at this. He said, one round hit him in his lower extremities, one passed through the crook of his right arm. He said, and this one hit him right in the chest. He said, it penetrated the vest because it wasn't designed to stop a high-powered rifle. But he said, look, Merle, it punched through it, but it deflected it and took some of the punch out of it. He said, so it went in behind his right breast skittered around the barrel of his rib cage and popped out behind his left breast. He said if he'd not been wearing that vest, Merle, he would have taken out his heart and lungs, he'd have been dead before he hit the ground. I get chill bumps right now, but almost 40 years, I get chill bumps down to my, to my ankles. Uh, and I shuddered. You could almost feel the shuffle of angels' feet, you know, around us there in that ER that day. And I knew I was not alone. I didn't understand it. But I knew that I and we were not alone. And, uh, and I tell people, you know, don't tell me God doesn't speak to people anymore. Uh, that's not true. He may, he may not do it all the time, and he speaks to us through Scripture every day if we, if we read and study Scripture. But when he chooses to, he makes himself known. He's still here, and he's still in control, and he's not done with us yet. And... Uh, so that, uh, those kind of things shaped my life, and then I got into a situation where I had to run an internal affairs investigation and, and investigate a corrupt governor who was uh, forcing people into our agency and lowering standards in order to corrupt us and spy on us. And a big thing broke about one of them, and uh, I had to do a multi-state investigation, and uh, they weren't real happy with me in the governor's office uh, because it didn't turn out the way they wanted. And um, so then they began to to make life hard on me. And what they do in government then, and they still do today, is they, they will bring charges against someone and leak stuff. First, they'll leak stuff on them, get the, their friends in the press, some of them interested. And if you don't think it doesn't work this way, I'm sorry, it's just, that's the real world. And they get friendly press to take it, always looking. They may not be bad themselves, or they might be, but they're always looking for a story, and they'll take it, and whether it's true or not, and they'll run with it, and then uh, they'll come in. If that doesn't do the trick, they'll come in uh, and they'll bring charges against you for something and taint you in any way they can if they're afraid to go after you openly. And uh, all of that was beginning to take place with me, and... I decided I was going to have to leave that job. I didn't want to, and the uh, Lord showed up with an offer uh, from someone in the corporate world. And I went there, and uh, that just started a whole other timeline in my life. Uh, and I uh, didn't know exactly why I was there. I was a security manager investigator in the bail system. And uh, um, 
so many things uh, happen there. And as Michael, the character in these books is named Michael Parker. And he is, you know, based on me and things that happened to me. But Michael learned in the books, like I did, you know, that, um, you know, the world is not a nice and neat and tidy place, you know. And a lot of people who appear to be this are really this. And, uh, and some of them who smile, you know, have big teeth behind that smile and you never want to cross them uh, because they'll do anything they'll do anything to maintain power it's not just the money it's the power and I've told people uh, that it's many politicians I have known at very high levels because I've known you know presidents and senators and on and on and on but many people at that level of power they have so much power and they have done so many things in their life to maintain that power that uh, they are very reluctant to give it up. You know, and they've made a deal, a Faustian deal, a deal with the devil, many of them. They've made a deal that they're going to, they'd rather rule here on earth, you know, in hell on earth than they had to serve eternally in heaven. And so when it gets, even in their later years of life, when they may begin to stare at infirmity and, uh, and, and other conditions are they're just really reluctant to give up that power because they know what they've done they know what they've done to people to main that, maintain that power they know the deals they've made they've ransomed their soul and they equate retirement with death and they are terrified to stand before their maker they are terrified and uh, if you again if you don't think that it true with some of those folks, uh, then, you know, it's, uh, th- I'm sorry, this, that's just the way the world is. The world is a dangerous and dark place, and, you know, that's what we try to talk about in all our books. And then Michael finds out in a rented world book, too, that uh, the professional criminals are organized crime figures who tried to, to kill him were just choir boys uh, when it came to these corrupt political and corporate figures, you know, who would do anything. They made them look, the criminals, the organized crime people, look like car boys in what Michael calls, and I call in the books, the the unholy trinity of politics, crime, and business when it comes together. And they all kind of, you know, do things to help each other, and uh, it's just not quite like... uh, you know, we're led to believe sometimes when we're growing up. And so that's one of our, uh, our missions is to go out and talk to people and tell them that the world is a dark and dangerous place. This is not our home. This is not our home. We're just pilgrims passing through to eternity. You know, if you hadn't read Pilgrim's Progress, a classic, you know, I'd commend it to you sometimes. There's a lot of truth in that old book. And, uh, and when Christian starts his journey to the eternal city and all the dangers that he faces and uh, that's the way it is in the world and and uh, if you follow Christ then your your journey will be a tough one you know the Lord never promised us it would be easy you know he said they hated me they'll hate you and so uh, we try to tell people that uh, all is necessary to lose yourself in this world um, at times when the world is so seductive you know, here's something for free. You know, I can do this for you. I can do that for you. You know, uh, it, it, it's just so much darkness and danger. And all it takes to lose yourself and your eternal soul is to be turned around one time with your eyes closed and your conscience muted and to let go of the Lord's hand. That's what they want you to do. Listen to them. Turn you around once your eyes shut, whispering all that sweet nothings in your ear and and kind of damp down your, your conscience and that voice speaking to you saying, don't do it, don't do it. And then they want you to let go of the Lord's hand. And then you're lost before you know it. And um, so we've written a rented world. People ask me on radio stations sometimes, uh, well, The Ghostly Shade of Pale, that was an intriguing title, you know, uh, and with this rented world, what does that mean? Some of these secular stations, and of course, I love it when they ask me that, because I say that means this is not our home. Just passing through, this is just a rented world. 
just a temporary way station to eternity. And is there anything here worth, you know, bargaining away eternity for this? There's nothing here, you know. And I, I've been through a lot in my life, and, and I have reason, uh, by temporal standards, I have reason to to really have bad feelings and maybe hate and bitterness and uh, for some. and But, uh, you know, the Lord took all of that from me and, uh, and showed me, you know, that uh, you can't follow Him when you're carrying around all that stuff. And plus it just, it hurts you. It doesn't hurt the people that you're angry at. And besides that, it, uh, it mutes your, uh, your walk with Christ. Uh, and so, um, so I'm working on the redeem now, uh, and uh, uh, I hope, haven't had a chance to really get into these two books, but there are a lot of great messages there. So I'll just tell you that um, if you would like me to come speak to your church or your school uh, or a civic club, uh, I'll go anywhere anybody will have me. And uh, our books are now in a lot of middle schools and high schools, and we're thrilled about that. And the chance to go out and talk to young people before they have to face all of these uh, these uh, temptations, these snares, you know, that I faced along the way, and that's that's uh, part of our, our ministry. And uh, I would tell you that I uh, I came back to find God's hand, and I took a hold of it, you know, and I took a walk in in the woods of God, and I came out taller than the trees when I did, and I began to understand things that I never understood, you know, I was incapable of understanding without Him, and so. Uh, I love the Lord. I'll proclaim it uh, everywhere I go, no matter how hard it gets, no matter who attacks me and everything. The more they attack me, the more I shower them with love. Amen. The more I shower them with love. When they say, oh, this and that to me, I say, I hear a lot of, a lot of anger uh, there, but I, I suspect it's uh, suppressing a lot of pain, covering a lot of pain because you miss him. You long for him. And I said, I hear no love from you. I said, but I love you. Because he loved me when I thought I was unlovable. So I say thank you and God bless you. And thank you so much, Brother Jerry, for having me here today. Thank you, Merle. Appreciate that. Yes, Enjoyed it. And hope that everyone else did.